Well, I said I'm a hipster guy, and I like things that aren't necessarily attractive. Okay. And this, at first glance, looks like a fairly plain stoneware jug, the kind that was made from the 18th century well into the 20th century. Um, but this is nicely marked. You can see here, S. Routson, Doylestown. Okay. So there's a maker's mark. Sammy Routson was a, was a stoneware potter in Doylestown, Ohio, which is down in Wayne County in the 1830s and 40s and then he ultimately moved his business to Worcester in the, in the late 40s and <coughs> 50s. But what it's also marked is rough and ready. Okay. If you dig back into your history education, you might remember that Zachary Taylor was nicknamed Old Rough and Ready. Okay. In the Second Seminole War, he was a hero, and that was kind of his nickname. And as uh, the 1848 presidential election approached, he was nominated, and that was kind of his, his tag. He was Old Rough and Ready. That was, sure. was his, his, his gimmick for that election. So the theory is that this jug was probably made by Routson just as he was wrapping up his business in Doylestown in 1846-47. So the election was beginning to be take center stage in American politics. And Routson must have been a fan. I mean, it, it's such a distinctive phrase, I can't imagine him using it for any other reason other right, than right. it was a, a way of showing political support for Zachary Taylor's election. Okay. Um, you know, you take away the rough and ready and you just, you know, a Samuel Routson jug like this is at auction three, four, five hundred dollars. Okay. This is where the wild card comes in. And we we have a lot of wild cards in this business. Sure. I've never seen one of these sell. Okay. Now, like realtors, we look when we put a value on something, we look for comps. We look for similar things that have sold at auction right. and extrapolate from there. And I if can't, there are none, what do you, what do you do? Kind of guess. Okay. And it, it, it is some, some educated guesswork. So I figure if this is a three or four hundred dollar jug without that mark, that's gonna certainly add some, but how much you know, is it a six or seven hundred dollar jug? Yeah. And we have it estimated at three to six hundred dollars. Okay. But ultimately, on auction day, those estimates become academic, and it's down to the two people who want it most and where the bidding stops. Have you had a favorite piece go through the auction, or something that is very <coughs> surprising to you? Not necessarily just based on value, but but something that was an important piece or just an incredible piece. Uh, one of my favorite stories is um, about a little cup we sold a number of years ago. I was actually out in uh, western Missouri picking up two collections from the same collector. Okay. And so we were literally, we were loading up, we were closing the doors in the truck. I was getting into the car, we were ready to head back east to Ohio. And he said, oh, you know, I have one more thing I want to show you. He runs into his house, comes back out, and he has this little cup. It's only about that big, and it's made from horn, you know, steer horn. Okay, which horn. was common in the 18th and 19th sure, sure, century sure. Um, for hornsmiths who made all manner of household goods to make little cups out of horn. Okay. But what was interesting, on the one side it had a spread-winged shield-breasted eagle, so clearly an American piece. Right. And it said, <clears throat> General Clay, 1813. And on the back, it had a little engraved picture that was labeled Fort Miggs. Fort Miggs is uh, the fortification in what is now Perrysburg, right, Ohio. Right. And river. so we started to dig into the story, right, um, and turns out General Clay was Green Clay, who was, a, the, uh, who was the leader of the Kentucky Militia during the War of 1812. Okay. And when William Henry Harrison was entrenched at Fort Meigs in the, summer, in the spring and summer of 1813, he was getting bombarded by the British, and he called for help. Clay came up from Kentucky. Um, there was the first major bombardment in May and a second bombardment in July, and during that, because of Clay's help, he mm -hmm. was able to repel the British, and that largely secured northwest Ohio and northern Indiana from wow. the British. It was a key wow. pivotal moment between that and the Battle of Lake Erie a few months later. It, it was a ki ki pivotal moment in the War of 1812. Um, <clears throat> so this cup was a presentation piece by somebody, we don't know who, uh -huh. to General Clay, likely as a thank you for coming and saving, probably one of the Ohio militiamen, saving coming for coming saving our backsides from the British. Right, right. Um, so then it went home with General Clay <clears throat> and descended in his family. So there's so much information that we're able to piece together about sure. this. Sure. The, the two fascinating things that really got me interested, one was when I took the cup up to Fort Mix mm -hmm. and talked to the historian there. The, the engraving of the fort was so detailed that he was able to pinpoint that it was made between the two bombing Oh, wow, wow. Because after the first one, there was damage to the fort, and they repaired it. Okay. And then the second one had more damage and more repair. And the details were such that he could place it could figure before that out. the second bombing. Wow. Which was amazing. But the other interesting thing was the bottom of the cup was made from an 1802 silver dollar. Oh, cool. And on, on the underside, it was crudely scratched B.J. Clay. 
Green Clay's son was named Brutus Junius Clay. The Clay family had great names. Brutus Junius was, was one of my favorites. <laughs> and so it went from, from Green Clay to Brutus Junius Clay, uh -huh. down through the family to Cassius Marcellus Clay, who was the one who left they Kentucky, awesome names. went to Kentucky, moved to Aldrain County, Missouri. And he, and if his, I think it was his son was an ambassador so wealthy, and when, the heat, when that, that family died, they had an estate sale. And wow. our consigner went to that estate sale. And there was a big table full of odds and ends, and the auctioneer was just going to sell the whole table as one group. Yeah. And he said, can you just sell that one cup? That's all I'm interested in. So the auctioneer obliged, and turns out he was bidding against a coin dealer who only wanted the coin, only okay. wanted the silver dollar. Okay. So he would have destroyed the cup to get the silver dollar. Oh, wow. But the, the oh, consigner had not only had the cup, but had a newspaper clipping of the auction advertisement from 1974. Okay. Had his little sales ticket, showed horn cup, he paid $125 for it. Wow. So all this wonderful information, all this kind of came together in this wonderful little object that was so important to Ohio and Kentucky history, mm -hmm. War of 1812, <clears throat> and had been in the family from 1813 until 1974, then it, so it only had one owner outside the family. So when it finally came to auction, again, finding comps for it was tough. We ended up sure. estimating at eight to twelve thousand dollars, yeah. and it sold for um, just over forty-five thousand dollars. All the provenance, the story, all this kind of all came together and had everything you wanted to have to add sure. the most value. Wow.